One of the things that I have noticed that spiritual growth is very much linked to how well we are drinking from the springs of living water, which Romans 5 describes as God's love being poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Spiritual growth requires our roots to be constantly saturated with this living water, so that as Psalm 1 describes, we can be like a strong tree planted beside a stream. So Carol and I have been given a few goals this year to assist with the spiritual growth of each one of us, including ourselves. The first goal is to provide resources. As each of us prayerfully listens and responds to God's voice, showing us areas in our lives that require attention. It is our desire to provide resources that will help you as intentionally address the change God desires. Our second goal is to suggest ways in which we can support each other as a church community. To use another water metaphor, how can we offer a cup of water in the name of Jesus to a fellow traveler? The third goal is to build a team to work with us in this role. Since we are new to Oxford, this will be one of our greatest challenges. Last Sunday, Pastor Tyler spoke to us about the poor in spirit. In light of that, I would like to close with this prayer of promise from Isaiah 41. When the poor and needy seek water and there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, and the olive tree. I will set in the desert the cypress, the plain, and the pine tree together, that they may know and may consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. I'm doing a little bit of double duty today because um, Sandra is not here. She's on holidays. So I'm going to teach you the craft. So hopefully all of the kids got a little bag like this. And this is actually what we're going to make. We're going to make a travel tic-tac-toe game, which is really kind of cool. So what you're going to do is you're going to take the bag and you're going to empty it of its contents except for one thing, except for the piece of paper. You want to leave the piece of paper in there. So you're going to empty it out. So try and put it someplace that you can kind of keep track of it. Okay. And then you'll see that you have a band-aid. So the band-aid we're not dealing with right now. So just for now, put the band-aid aside. We'll come back to the band-aid. But the band-aid is there, okay? And then you'll see that you have a Sharpie, and you've got your paper and some strings, okay? And there's the paper inside because we don't want the Sharpie to bleed through. So your first job is to draw the tic-tac-toe lines, okay? So everybody know how to do that? You're going to draw the tic-tac-toe lines. And you can write tic-tac-toe at the top if you maybe are going to forget someday how to do it. So you can write it at the top if you want, but draw the tic-tac-toe lines, okay? Then after you finish that, the other thing that you're going to see is you're going to see 10 yellow stones. Now, the significance of this is that our verse today is, blessed are those that mourn, for they will be comforted. So what does your face look like when you're mourning? Anybody? Sad. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so yeah, so we're going to write. So you're going to take five of these yellow stones and you're going to put sad faces on them. Okay? So like sad emojis. Takes me, I said I have emoji stress because it takes too long for me to pick what emoji I want to say. Anyway, <laughs> it's just a little aside. Um, <laughs> And then you have five more. But what happens when we mourn, how do we get comforted? Anybody? A hug, sure. 
people comfort us, right? The Lord comforts us. His word comforts us. But he's also given us people here to comfort us. So the other five, you're going to make smiley faces or smiley emojis. You can make them as creative as you want. Okay? So that's those, those 10 stones. Now, this is kind of the tricky part. It took me a little while to figure this out last night. So you might need your parents' help with this. The strings are pretty uh, stiff. But what you're going to find is that you're going to find that there's holes. There, the, the tops of these are separated and there's holes inside. The tricky part is it actually has to, each string has to go all the way around, but opposite. Okay? So you're going to take one string and put it through. And you're going to thread it all the way around. So the loop will be on one side. Then you're going to take the second string and you're going to start it where the loop is. And you're going to string it all the way around again. Okay. And then at the end, you should have little bits of, of the string left over. And if you tie those strings here like this, I don't know if you can see or not, then you can actually pull it shut. Okay. So it's kind of a cool little... Um, craft that you can take with you in your car and then if you want to well you should anyway even if you don't want to <laughs> but um this is why they don't let me do this very often <laughs> i make it up as i go to put the band-aid away and uh put it back in your bag because tyler is going to talk to you about the band-aid later all right all right you can enjoy that we're going to continue to worship Well, it's so good to uh, see everyone this morning. Gwen and I are so glad to be back off of our holidays, and we had uh, just a great time away. Uh, the first week with with five of our grandchildren, we do a cousin's camp with them, and then we go away for a week to recuperate after that. So we were up north. We were able to swim in a bunch of lakes and just uh, have some great time away. And then this past week, uh, I was just at home doing... Uh, um, Gwen's list that she has for me. Well, not really. I, I make a list too and just worked around our house and got a lot of things done. You know, this summer we are taking a look at the Beatitudes and Tyler's going to come in just a couple minutes to take on the next one. And then we have elders and deacons uh, sharing this, this summer. Um, we have a lot to prepare for as we go into the new year. And we're just thankful for the staff team and all that they're doing. Now, this morning, I, I'm I'm doing the object lesson before the message here on this family service because Mary is, has really bad asthma right now. And uh, so you could pray for her. And then she's also preparing for camp. And we have a number of VBS invitations, destination dig back there as well that we'll hand out to you uh, that you can give to others. And uh, people can just sign up online for that, August 23rd to the 27th. But here's the object lesson this morning. Uh, I've got a bucket of water. Anybody need the bucket of water right now? Let me throw it on you. Pretty close. I'm not going to be long. But, but one of the things that we're talking about is God's mercies today. And uh, this bucket of water is about half full of water. So if this bucket of water is half full, how much do you think there is there? Can you measure it? Yeah, you can. So I'm going to measure it this morning with an eyedropper. It's going to take us a bit of time. Okay? But we're, we're going to just do it. I'm going to count. You can do this at home. If you don't have anything else better to do, you can do this at home. And just get a bucket of water and just start counting out. Draw it. One, two, three, four, five, six. 7, 9, 10, 11, 11, 12, 13, 14, 4 p.m., 5 million, 533. Can you, can you imagine? You missed one. I'm reminded of some great scriptures. And one of them is being, is in Lamentations 3. And you got to remember this. It just says in verse 22, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions 
or his mercies never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. When we think of God's mercies, we often think, and as as uh, Phil and Carol introduced uh, us and welcomed us this morning, we're, we're just thankful that the water represents the mercies and the blessings of God. And I mean, I only have a, a few of the mercies of God. But for the believer in Jesus Christ, every one of us who knows Christ is given mercy upon mercy. And I think of swimming up with Justin in off of Manitoulin Island on our holidays and swimming out to the third sandbar and seeing right to the bottom. It's so clear. And that great body of water, all of that is still smaller than all the mercies of God to us. When you think of all the water on the earth, it's not like the amount of God's mercies to us every day. And when we know Christ, we can experience his mercies. Sometimes we might think it's just little drops along the way. Sometimes it's buckets of mercy. Sometimes it's just lakes and rivers of mercy that flow into our life because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we mourn, we receive mercy. And that's the amazing thing about God today. So you can get your dropper out. Or maybe uh, you can get your baster out. Or a bucket. Fill a pool. I hope it reminds you of the mercies of God. You already heard from Robin. I can probably just go home now. Um, as we look this morning at the, the Beatitudes, we continue on with the second one for our family service. I was told I get 15 minutes. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but you guys can turn to Matthew chapter 4. Uh, or Matthew chapter 5, we're looking specifically at verse 4 today, but we'll read all the Beatitudes, verses 1 to 11, together just to remember everything and, and put them all in context with one another. So let's read Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Seeing the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. As we begin this morning, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. Uh, for your word, we thank you for these beatitudes that we see, these blessings we have uh, for those that are part of your kingdom. God, I pray this morning that uh, as we study these and as we see what it means to be someone who mourns, that you would just um, open our eyes to the truth of your scripture, that you would break our hearts of our sin, and that we will come to you today. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Uh, just so you all know, uh, there are notes available on the website. They're kind of uh, fill-in spots where you can push add note and then it has the notes provided for you and you can add your own spot and email them to yourself. Um, there's also uh, the music on the website for while we're singing. So if you didn't get enough pages for your family, you can pull it up on your phone. So those are easily found right when you click join us at Oxford. Last week, we looked at the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we saw how, how we saw how being poor in spirit 
had ultimately nothing to do with physical poverty. Instead, being poor in spirit referred to how we view ourselves before God. We saw uh, the call from God, from Jesus here in these Beatitudes, to come to God as a beggar, having no resources or possessions or skills or anything else that God needs. Instead, we come to him and we call out for mercy because we have nothing to offer. And we ask the question, do we come to God as people who are spiritually bankrupt? Do we come to God realizing that there's nothing we have to offer, uh, that there's nothing we can do, and all we have is to come before him and ask for his mercy and for his grace? This call was not just for some, but instead I believe it's, it's true of anyone who wants to enter the kingdom of heaven. Everyone who enters the kingdom of heaven must come to God poor in spirit. And, and that was, I think, all Jesus really said on that. And now as we come to Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, we see the, the second beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we briefly mentioned last week how all eight of these beatitudes kind of link together. And I believe that we would be doing the text injustice if we were to just take one out and, and not think about what uh, the Beatitudes around them as well. And so today, uh, we need to keep in mind what we learned last week about being poor in spirit as we come to the text and see what it means to, uh, be, to be a mourner. I think the best place to start as we come to this verse, verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, is to ask the question, what does it mean to mourn? And we've talked about that a little bit already this morning through some of the examples. The dictionary says to mourn is to feel sorrow or uh, deep regret. To feel sorrow or deep regret. This could be uh, a sadness because of something that's happened in our lives. Uh, we could, and normally it's associated with the loss of a loved one, the passing away of someone like a parent or a grandparent, a sibling, a friend. Um, for our kids, Maybe you've experienced mourning when your family pet has passed away, or even when one of your friends has had to move away. Mourning is not simply sadness, though. It's deeper than that. It's a state of emotion that affects our whole being and goes through our, our whole bodies. We, we just experience um, this full sadness throughout our whole body. Like it, It's not just a simple sadness and shedding of tears. It's deeper. Many of us have experienced mourning, some of us more recently than others, some of us more often this, uh, than others. And when we look at the world around us, we often see the suffering and the death and the bad things that are happening. Sin has caused so much destruction, and it leaves a path of sorrow and despair behind it. We live in a world full of people who mourn. People more than anything, that are looking for comfort. See, mourning and sadness, is, it's just part of being a human in this fallen world. And in fact, God has given us sadness and tears uh, and as part of the way for us to heal. It's healthy for us to, to heal those ways. And we see throughout Scripture, mourning isn't something new. Uh, we see many people mourn in Scripture. In Genesis chapter 23, verse 2, we see Abraham mourn over the death of his wife, wife Sarah. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 2, we see the nation of Israel mourn over the loss of Moses. And actually, even I know as I've read through the Scriptures and, and Moses dies at the end of Deuteronomy, you've been with Moses for so long, you, you feel the, the sorrow of this guy passing away too as you read through. In the Psalms, Psalm 42, verse 3, my tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all the day long. Well, I say, well, they say to me all the day long, where is your God? The psalmist knows mourning. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Paul himself talks about how he's mindful of the mourning of Timothy after he has experienced a great discouragement. And then there's a story that I think most of us are familiar. John chapter 11, the story of Lazarus. We're told 
that Lazarus was loved very much by his sisters Mary and Martha, and that when he died, they were mourning his death. And, and not just them, but others came to mourn alongside of them. And you remember, it's a powerful, powerful story. Jesus comes and he doesn't tell them to stop mourning. He doesn't tell them to stop crying. Instead, instead we're told in John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept. Jesus mourned with these people. Tears, mourning, and sadness are part of human life. And so now that we can have an idea of what mourning is, is, why is mourning blessed? It says, blessed are those who mourn. It's kind of an interesting statement when we uh, think of someone being blessed because they're mourning. Some might argue that uh, in these moments of mourning, uh, God works inside of our hearts, uh, that in these moments of mourning, he brings us closer to himself. And I would agree with both of those statements In our greatest need, we often turn to God and can experience tremendous spiritual growth as we rely on him. I don't think, however, that that's what Jesus is talking about. How can there be blessing in mourning? I think the key to understanding the second beatitude is to first remember the context of what's come before it and what's around it, and then then to understand what are they mourning over. Why are they mourning? What's the object of mourning? Is Jesus talking about any mourning? Anytime? Anytime you mourn at all, you will be blessed? Or does he have something more specific in mind? As we said, it's okay to mourn. It's okay to be sad. There are correct times in our lives for this to happen. It's healthy. But Sometimes our mourning can become self-centered. In 1 Kings chapter 21, we have the story of Ahab, and he's jealous of Naboth's vineyard. And he's so jealous that he mourns the fact that he doesn't have the vineyard. And in verse 4, he goes as far, Ahab does, as to be mourning so much about not having with this jealousy that he uh, actually, it says he lays down and he won't eat. This is unhealthy mourning. It's a self-centered type of mourning. This can happen to people too sometimes when they lose a loved one. It's normal to be sorrowful because someone has has passed away and they're not with you anymore. But uh, sometimes that mourning goes on for too long and the focus now turns on themselves and what they've lost and it becomes all about them. And that is another type of unhealthy mourning. So what type of mourning is Jesus talking about then? What type of mourning is Jesus talking about then? I think Jesus here is talking specifically about mourning over our sin. Mourning over our sin. When we come to God, poor in spirit, with our sin, we mourn. We have tears, sadness, guilt over what we have done and who we are because we're broken before God. When we come to him, we have this deep sense of realizing who God is, and it just breaks our heart. We need to look at our sin so seriously that we mourn over our sin. That when we come before God, our sin brings us to our knees. I'm not talking about having self-pity, where we feel sorry for ourselves. That's often self-centered, attention-seeking behavior. I'm talking about coming to God, mourning over our sin, and just being broken by it. Being broken by how sinful we are. Our sin should break our heart whenever we sin. Think of the song we've sung it many times here before, Hosanna. The words in it, break my heart for what breaks yours. Sin breaks God's heart. Our sin breaks God's heart. It should break ours as well. Does your sin today break your heart? Does it break your heart when you sin? Consider 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. It says, As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, some translations say mourned, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so you suffered no loss through us. 
for God, godly grief produces repentance and leads to salvation without regret, regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. We don't just mourn over sin for the sake of mourning. The spiritual mourning that we face, when we mourn over our sin, it brings us to God and it brings us to repentance. That's where we can ask for mercy and trust in God's amazing grace. That's where our mourning leads us, to God to ask for mercy and trust his amazing grace. And when we come to God broken in our sin and we come to him like this, just um, as we see ourselves just completely broken, that's when blessing happens. That's when we receive comfort. John MacArthur says, when a sinner comes to a place of recognizing spiritual bankruptcy, when the sinner comes to a place of grief, deep grief, deep sorrow over sin, and comes before God in penance and asks for mercy and grace, he receives the comfort of forgiveness. And that's the last point. We, <clears throat> we're not just to be broken of our sin for no reason. It's not just so that we can be broken, that being broken over our sin is the end goal. We mourn our sin because then we see, receive the incredible comfort of God. And that is the blessing. In other words, we come before God broken and we receive forgiveness. It's, it's an amazing, amazing blessing that Jesus is talking about here. And it really works and, and ties in with what we talked about last week. Those who are in God's kingdom come to God to mourn their sin and it causes them to come to God broken. And when they do that, they receive forgiveness and that forgiveness brings incredible comfort. As a father, there have been times uh, where my son Ezra has done things that have hurt me. And if you're a parent, you've probably had those times in your life as well. Times when he hasn't listened and maybe it broke something as a result of it. Times when he looks at, at me and just says no. Times when he even pushes his brother and makes him cry because he thinks it's funny. And of those times when he hurts me, eventually he comes to me and he says that he's sorry. And I offer forgiveness and usually a big hug along with it. And there's comfort in that. Maybe you've experienced that with someone before. You've hurt them some way. Maybe when you were a kid, you can think of doing this with your parents. Maybe as a parent, you can look back and think of doing this now. Uh, you've hurt them some way. And when you come to them and you ask for forgiveness and they forgive you of what you've done, there's this awesome sense of comfort. If you're one of our kids joining us today, maybe there's a time when you've done something that just made your parents really sad, and you've seen that, you didn't listen to a rule, you broke something, you said something that was mean to your mom or dad, and maybe you eventually told them you were sorry. You asked for forgiveness, and I'm sure they forgave you. And they probably gave you a big hug after that. Doesn't that make you not feel the guilt of your sin anymore? Don't you enjoy the comfort of that embrace after? When we come to God broken, he gives us comfort through forgiveness. Think of the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. After receiving a great inheritance from his father, he goes away, uh, the son goes away and lives recklessly and sinfully, and he wastes his entire inheritance, gone. And he comes to a point where he has no money, no friends, no family, no job, nothing. And so he gets a job feeding the pigs of the field, we're told. And he's so bad off financially now that he is actually eating the, pig, the food for the pigs just to survive. And he decides he can't live like this anymore. He needs to ask for forgiveness from his father. Maybe his father will take him back and he can be a slave there because they get treated better than how he is. And so he returns home. And when the father sees him, he runs out to him and he meets him at the road and he gives him a, he gives him a huge hug. He embraces him and he offers forgiveness and he restores him as his son and brings him back into his house. 
Imagine the comfort that that prodigal son felt in his father's arms. He had been gone so long. He had sinned so much, but he was forgiven. And now he had comfort. He was broken by that sin and he received the comfort of forgiveness. This is why it says, blessed are those who mourn. This is why it's a blessing to mourn because the comfort of forgiveness that we receive from God is incredible. It's just an unexplainable comfort we receive when we're broken of our sin and we come to God and we repent and he forgives us. It's such an incredible, incredible feeling. So as we conclude then, how today can we be someone who mourns? Because uh, I don't know if I made it super clear last week. I want to make sure I am clear. I, I think these blessings that we see here, these are not just extra little blessings that are sprinkled on top. You're a believer in Jesus Christ. Here's a little extra blessing for you. These are, are blessings of people who are believers in Jesus Christ, of people in God's kingdom. And if we're not experiencing these blessings, then, then we might not be part of God's kingdom. And so how can we pe be people who mourn? Because I think we're called here to be people who mourn our sin. How can we come to God broken over it? Well, quite simply, I think we need to have a soft heart for sin. We need to have a soft heart for sin. Your heart can become hard towards sin, like the callus on your hand, right? When you use a tool for a long period of time, you will get a callus and it gets hard and then it doesn't hurt anymore. Uh, you don't feel that pain of the, the tool rubbing in that area anymore. Our heart, that happens to it as well. When we there's a sin in our life, uh, that sin can callous our heart that it doesn't break it anymore. It doesn't hurt us anymore to do that sin. So how can we stop our heart from getting hard? Think of the story of Israel and Egypt through the plagues. And we saw Pharaoh's heart was hard. He had a hard heart. And he wouldn't let Israel go. We don't want to have a heart, heart like that. We want to have a soft heart that is broken easily by our sin. So I have eight things to help us today to be people who mourn. Number one, we need to study the scriptures. To keep our hearts soft, we need to study the scriptures. Look through them. See throughout the Bible, we have examples of people who've been broken. Uh, we see the call to come with a broken and contrite heart. The Psalms is full of examples of people broken by their sin. And as we study these stories, we need to think about them and apply them to our lives. The second thing we need to do to uh, have a soft heart or keep our heart soft is to just pray. Pray, God, will you keep breaking my heart? God, will you keep uh, me to have a broken and contrite heart? Ask God to help you. The third thing that we need to do, we need to stop loving our sin and willfully partaking and enjoying it. Stop loving our sin and willfully partaking in and enjoying it. We need to see sin as a serious deal. It's a big deal. Our sin is a huge deal. And if there's sin in our lives and we just continue to ignore it or we just say, you know, I really like this sin, so I'm going to keep it on the side, our hearts will become hard to sin. We need to stop loving our sin and willfully partaking and enjoying in it. Number four, we need to stop believing our sin isn't a big deal. If we want to have a soft heart, we need to see that all of our sin is a big deal. And if you think your sin is not a big deal, then you ultimately are saying the blood of Jesus Christ isn't a big deal because the blood of Jesus Christ paid for sin. Is sin serious? Yes. Sin is so serious that Jesus gave his life for it. We need to see sin as being serious. Stop believing sin isn't a big deal. The fifth way to keep our hearts soft is to stop believing that we're good enough. And this kind of refers to last week's message. We need to come to God as if we're poor in spirit. We need to come to God uh, realizing that we are sinful people. The sixth thing, we need to stop thinking that we're too far gone or have self-pity because of our sins. Our hearts become hard when we insist and continue to say that God can't save us, that my sin's too bad. 
We need to look at ourselves, realize how great and awesome the mercy of Jesus Christ is, that it can pay and cover every single sin. The seventh thing, we need to stop waiting to repent. If you want to keep your heart soft, soft, stop waiting to repent. The longer we let unconfessed sin kind of percolate in our hearts, the harder our hearts will become. We need to be broken by our sins often and experience the comfort of God regularly. Come to him all the time, broken. And we see that. I think we can see that in our world, right? But we people that don't know God, as they get older, they just continue to get harder to the, to the gospel, don't they? Stop waiting to repent. Repent of your sin. Be broken of it and experience the comfort immediately. Don't worry. Trust the blood of Jesus. And finally, we need to spend time to think and reflect. We need to spend time every day quietly reflecting in our hearts, thinking about our relationship with God, thinking about the sin and our severity of sin. And we need to spend time thinking about what we need to repent for. Coming before him, asking God for forgiveness. Spend time. And as we do those eight things, I think as we, those help us keep our hearts soft. And when we have a soft heart, it will be broken easily to sin. And when our heart is broken easily to sin, we can be people who mourn. And so as we conclude, three things to say. First, we have amazing news. Today, you should be sad. You should mourn your sin, but your sadness will be received by incredible happiness and comfort in the forgiveness of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's amazing. If you know Jesus Christ, we mourn our sin, but we experience incredible comfort of forgiveness. Enjoy the blessing of the comfort of the forgiveness of your sins. Secondly, if you're here today and your heart has been hardened by sin, pray that God will break it. Ask him to to break your heart. He can break the hardest of hearts. Only he can do it. And he can break your heart. And finally, if you're today and you've been mourning over your sin for a long time, and, and it's just been weighing on your life for a while, your sin has been just, it, it's like a burden on top of you. Bring it to God. Call out for mercy. Receive forgiveness. And experience the comfort of that today. What are you waiting for? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, today for this incredible blessing that we have. We thank you, God, that you comfort us. God, I pray for us that we would see sin as being a big deal, that God, uh, you would keep our hearts soft, that you would break us over our sin, that we will come to you regularly and, and, and repent of our sin and experience the comfort of your forgiveness. God, I pray today for those here that don't know you, I pray, God, that you will break their heart from their sin. God, I pray that if there's someone here who has sin weighing in on their life, but Lord, they haven't brought it to you, uh, they haven't received the comfort, that today would be the day that God they will find comfort in you and forgiveness in you today. God, we thank you for this incredible blessing that you give us, that we can receive comfort when we come to you as people who mourn. And we pray this in your name. Amen. You can be seated. You know, when we had our grandchildren with us that week, we went through a lot of bandages. Um, and in the packs today, we have a band-aid. And you know what? I've cut myself a few times over the last few months doing renovations at home. And there's just something about putting a band-aid on that brings comfort. But even more comfort is when I say, Gwen, would you put the band-aid on for me? When somebody else does. But band-aids of this world only last a short time, right? 
And in our spiritual lives, we need the complete saving comfort of Jesus in our life. And um, you might have a band-aid at home, and you might be trying to cover up things yourself, but um, the only true one that can give you that forgiveness that we all need is Jesus. He covers over all of our sin, not just pieces of our life, but everything. And as Tyler was preaching today, when we mourn our sin, God brings us the comfort. And maybe you're here today, you need to talk more about that. Um, I'm back in the office tomorrow. We're, we're available to talk this week. Um, the staff is uh, just to talk things through. Make sure that you're not counting on your bandages to save you, but to be covered by the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll hang around today, too. It's so good to see everybody today, too. So let me pray as we conclude. Father, thank you so much for just a beautiful morning in which we've been able to come and just hear from you. We thank you, Father, for the birds singing as we worship to you. We are thankful, Father, for this place that you've given to us. And as we move forward together as a congregation, we are thankful for just teaching us your word, being able to worship together and uh, come before you, the true and living God. So bless us, we pray, Lord, and lead us and guide us in each of our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, thanks for joining us today. There are invite cards there for VBS Destination Day that you can uh, take at the back as well. And uh, just to remember to uh, uh, this coming week, as we look forward to next Sunday, uh, to, to sign in online. That just helps us out with registration. And for all of those who have been visiting as well, and we're just thankful that you've been coming and being a part of us here at Oxford. I'd be glad to speak with you afterwards as well. God bless you and uh, have a great afternoon.